Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says. Because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, there was a, a professor, Professor Melvin. Uh, his last name is Vopson. And he is from uh, the University of Portsmouth. And he is a professor, an associate professor of physics. And he came out with a very interesting belief that has been on the internet quite a bit these last few days. He believes that he can prove that we are not living a real life here, that actually we are living in a matrix kind of in some type of computer simulation. And um, he claims that this computer simulation, that the proof of it is embedded in the Bible. And he argues that the Word of God has a very famous sentence that refers to the underlying computer code that governs and controls the simulation that we're actually living in. So how many of you have ever seen the movie The Matrix? All right. Well, we do understand that in this movie, everything that existed was a computer simulation, whether it was big or small, and that the computer simulation consisted of numbers and letters and and somewhat kind of like back in the old days when everything was in binary code was zeros and ones, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, whatever. And he believes that there's an overlap in the belief of this simulated universe and the religious beliefs that we have and that they fit together harmoniously. Now I'm going to read to you a statement he said. It's not a long statement, but he said, this perspective aligns with religious beliefs that hold that human life is to be meaningful and purposeful even within the context of a larger design. Then he goes on to say this, instead of viewing the simulated universe hypothesis as an antagonistic thought to religious beliefs, one can see it as offering a complementary perspective to our Christian beliefs. Well, that immediately made me think of a scripture verse, 1 Corinthians 3.19. It says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. Now, in my opinion, this hypothesis that he came up with answers a question that I've often had in my life. How stupid can some people be? Well, the scripture he was referring to, and, and I'm not calling him stupid. The scripture that I just read did. Okay. John 1.1 1, 1 says, and here is where he gets his theory that the Bible backs it up. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now, inadvertently, he stumbled onto a truth. He just, this professor just doesn't see it. In the beginning was the Word. You notice that's a capital W. That's talking about Jesus. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, for the Father and I are one. Jesus, the Word, and the Father are one. Okay? They may have different functions within the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but they are one. To my daughter, Sherry, Loretta and I are her one parents. We are her parents. But Loretta has a function, I have a function, but... Together we are one. Then it goes on to verse 2. It says, He, now who is the He? He is the Word that it's referring to in the previous sentence. It doesn't say it. 
It says he. He was in the beginning with God. Look at verse 3. All things were made through him. Who's the him? The word. And without him, the word, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. In him who? In him the word. In the word. Remember Jesus said that he was the life? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Remember John said, we need to understand this. God is light. Hmm. And the light shines. Who is the light? The light is the life, which is the Word, which is Jesus, which is God. They are one. These three, the Father, it says this in Ephesians, the Father, the Word, now, now follow me on this, and don't, don't get weird on it, but it doesn't say Jesus. It says, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, these three are one clearly telling us that the Word is Jesus. All right? Now, in the original Greek, and we don't have time to get into a Greek lesson today, but John said in the original Greek, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, for those of you scholars who know Greek, you'll see that the very last word there in the Greek is logos. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But it's interesting that in John 1.14, John goes on to say, and the Word, who is the Word? Jesus. Became flesh. And dwelt among us, and this is what the professor's talking about. He's saying the word that, that was just the word became flesh. And he says that we are the flesh, that the word, which is artificial intelligence according to him, and I believe that there are some professors that have artificial intelligence. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. His. The Word is a person. It's the person, the second person of the Trinity. The glory as of the only begotten. So if it's not clear, now John defines it even further. The Word is the only begotten of the Father. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, full of grace and truth. So we can see that that lines up with something else. And for those of you who take Loretta's Hebrew class on Thursday, you might recognize this. Genesis 1 says, in Hebrew, says, in the beginning, Barashit, bara, Elohim, et Hashemim Haaretz as Amos so eloquently put it this last Thursday night. And Loretta, they had an amazing teaching. If you weren't here Thursday night, you need to watch this online. It was amazing. But in the beginning. Now, I just want to make one minor comment here. In the beginning, that's not God's beginning. I, I do receive quite a bit of mail concerning in the beginning. Because I have a, a teaching out there about the world before Adam and Eve. And there's a lot of people who write me and say there was nothing before the beginning. When the Bible says in the beginning, there was nothing before that. That's not true. God was before that. God has eternally existed. There is no beginning with God. When the Bible says in the beginning, it's not referring to God's beginning. He has no beginning. You can't write an autobiography. He couldn't write an autobiography because there's no place to start. There was never a time when he was given birth. There was never a time when he started. You can go back a bazillion trillion years to the trillionth power, 
And you're not going to be any closer to the beginning of God than you are now because there is no beginning. So when the Bible says in the beginning, it's talking about things relevant to us. If I were to take my daughter and I would say, I want to tell you about your life and what's going to happen and how things work out. In the beginning, when you were born, and, and I didn't mean in the beginning of creation, I, I go back to what's relevant to her. So in the beginning is talking about us. Now, when it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the Word was God, in the Greek language, there's two words that are translated word. There's rhema and logos. So when you look at the original language in our, in our English Bible, and it says in the beginning was the word, it could say logos, which is translated word, or it could say rhema, which is translated word. And you may say, well, what difference does that make? Well, those two words in the Greek mean different things. Logos means the written Word of God. Basically, it means the written Word of God. And rhema, basically, now there's more to their meanings than that, but basically rhema means the revealed Word of God. Like when you get a revelation. And sometimes you can read a scripture, and you're reading it in logos mode, and then all of a sudden it kind of converts to rhema mode. It becomes alive. It's kind of like in Romans 10, 17, where it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word for word there in the original Greek is rhema. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the revealed word of God, not just reading the word, but when the word comes alive inside of me. Well, I always thought that when it says in the beginning was the word, it would be the word rhema. But just a few years ago, I discovered, I was looking in my Greek New Testament, and I discovered it says, in the beginning was the Logos, which gives us greater revelation to the understanding that Jesus is the Word. Also, when you get a revelation of the written Word, it becomes the living Word inside of you, and that's where faith is. Now, we take, this is the word logos. Lambda, omicron, gamma, omicron, sigma. Now, this is the word that is used there. Now, here's what the professor, associate professor, didn't understand, but it is so true. We are, it is true, we are living in a world that was created by words. Because everything that was made was made by the Word of God. And there are codes in God's creation, and they have a pattern. I don't have time to get into it. We could almost do a series on this. And I don't know how many of you even recognize this word, but fractals. Fractals are something in science they almost don't understand. Mathematicians and, and uh, botanists for years have been trying to figure out how fractals really work. But there's patterns within things. Within plants, there's patterns. And the patterns just keep repeating all the way down to a cellular level. Their existence defies the logic of man. But why, is, why are there patterns? It's not because we're part of a computer simulation. That's not why there's patterns. There are patterns because everything that was made that was made was made by the Word. He is the Creator, and everything He creates has a pattern. I was noticing the other day, I like to watch some science documentaries, and, and some of them are, are great, and some of them are not. But there's interesting things that you can glean from these. They, they had a submergible object that went down into the ocean into a place that was deeper than man has ever gone. And they had digital cameras, and these cameras took pictures. And they went so deep that there is no light whatsoever. And they discovered that there were some creatures down there that actually 
emanated light. They actually looked like they were lit up. Now, I've seen some of you on a Saturday night lit up. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about a different type of light, okay? Now, so, here's the thing. How, how, does that, how does that work? And here's something else interesting. I was looking at this one creature, and it had two eyes, something that resembled a nose, and a mouth. Kind of like you guys and me. Now, now, how can this be? It's because we have the same Creator. And He has patterns. Now, when it comes to the Hebrew language, I just want to mention this when it comes to patterns. It has been said by some of the ancient sages and rabbis that each letter in the Hebrew language has 70 dimensions. 70 dimensions. One dimension is the letter itself. For example, the very first letter in the Hebrew language is Aleph. The second letter is Bet. It's kind of like in the, the Greek language is patterned off the Hebrew language. In the Greek language, the first two letters are Alpha, Beta. Well, what do we have in English? A, B. So, if that doesn't make you think. But at any rate, one letter, one is just the letter itself. Another may be a symbol. For example, the letter, letter Aleph, it's ox, isn't it? Is, is a symbol for that. It also has a color. It has a frequency. It, it, it has a number. For example, Aleph is one. Bet is two. And it goes all the way down to Tav, which is 400. Now, here's the whole thing. You can do mathematical equations with the Hebrew language. It's really interesting how you can do that. But one of the things that each letter has is a tone. It has a frequency. Now, let me explain something to you. King David had a harp. So, on his harp, there were 22 strings. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters. So each string on his harp represented a letter. It also, each one represented a tone. It's three octaves. You say, well, there's eight notes in an octave, three times eight is 24. Yeah, but you get, <laughs> you get middle C twice, whatever. So there's 22 in three octaves. So the Bible tells us that when King Saul was demon-possessed, demons were tormenting him, and he was acting like a lunatic, that David would show up with his harp, and he would play the harp, and the demons left. Now, why, why did the demons leave? David must have been playing a catchy tune. Dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. Louis, Louis. Dun, dun, dun. No. And the demons go, whoa. We can't stay with that song being played and left. No, he wasn't playing a catchy tune. He was playing notes, and the notes in the realm of the Spirit were being converted into letters, and he was literally playing the Word of God. He was playing the Hebrew language. Now, you say, oh, that, 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 that can't be. Okay, now there's, there's a gentleman, I didn't know him personally, he was just acquaintance uh, through correspondence, but his name is Uri Heller. Uh, he has since passed away. He moved to Israel and he passed away over in Israel. But he was a, uh, and, and he was a, a Jewish professor at um, Arizona State University. And he had a project there, and the man's, he, he, he was not, as far as I know, and I'm not judging anyone's salvation, but I'm just saying this, as far as I know, he was not a Christian. He was, he was full Jewish. May have been a Christian, because I know some of the Jewish people he hung around with who are. But nevertheless, he had a project at Arizona State University called the Music from God Project. And what he did is he took the... 23rd Psalm, 
First, he converted all 22 letters into frequencies over three octaves, into notes. And then he fed letter by letter of the 23rd Psalm, one letter, one letter, one, into a computer and converted the letters in the 23rd Psalm into music frequencies. And ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the 23rd Psalm in the Hebrew language. Now, now, think of this. That's the 23rd Psalm in Hebrew. God wrote that music. If you want to know what kind of music God likes, I'm sure he likes various kinds of music. But that's music from God. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Now, here's something. In the 23rd Psalm, no, no, let, let me go a little step further here. In Psalm 138, verse 2, there's a scripture in the New King James that says this, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above your name. Now, how powerful is the word of God? Well, according to this scripture, he magnifies his word above his name. However, in my study, that scripture has always bothered me because there is nothing above the name. All the scriptures I can find about the name says everything that exists in heaven, on earth, on below the earth has got a kneel to the name of Jesus, to the name. There's nothing. And then this scripture says that God has magnified his word, which we know the word is Jesus, but he's magnified the word above the name. To me, it just seemed confusing. So I did a little study on this, and I began to find out that in the Hebrew language, there's a great controversy going on with the translators, both here and in Israel, about how that verse should be translated. And I began to also discover that some other translations translate it the way that they do in Israel sometimes. So just follow me on this. There's two groups of translators. One group translates it the way I've always read it in the New King James, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. However, for example, Many of my friends are using the ESV, which is the English Standard Version. And here's what it says in Psalm 138.2. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. It gives equal representation of the word and the name. In other words, they are above everything. Well, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is this. You respect the word, you respect the name, and nothing should be above them. So we could get into an argument, not I wouldn't, but some people could get into an argument over which way that should be. But bottom line is, the word and the name, they're up there. They're at the top. So, the word and the name of the word is all powerful. 
Now, His name, in His name and in His Word, exists all power and all authority. All power and authority over what? All, all miracles are subject to the name and the Word. All healing, your healing, is subject to the name and the Word. Restoration of your life, your broken heart. What's the answer? The Word and the name. That's the answer. Now listen to this. If all miracles, if all healing, the sickness and disease that the doctor has said that you have, it's subject to the name. It's subject to the Word. That financial problem, that poverty, that broken heart, what somebody did to you years ago and you can't seem to get rid of it, or somebody died and you don't understand why and you just can't get rid of the grief, let me tell you something. The Word and the name are above that grief. They're above, above that pain. You want your broken heart healed, you need to be dealing with the Word and with the name. And you're saying, well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I understand Jesus and His Word and His name. That's above everything. But I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Well, Matthew 28, 18 Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Where do you live? Your citizenship is in heaven, but where do you live? You're living on earth. Well, on earth, all authority, and now listen to me, all authority was given to Jesus. Where? In heaven and on earth. But in Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you hurt you when you're in heaven no when you are where you are on earth there been a lot of applause and shouting there and if the video department could just show some things being thrown up into the air and people leaping and running around the church on that statement. Just, I'll wait while they just dub that in. In the beginning was the Word. You want to know what the title of my message is today? Hey, in the beginning was the Word. Well, let me tell you something. He's still here. He hasn't gone away. He, the Word, is still here. And He still has all the power and authority within Himself. And then He has given you the power of attorney to use His name. The Word has given you power of attorney to use His name over serpents and scorpions, over everything demonic, over all the power of the enemy, sickness, disease, poverty, broken heart, everything and nothing shall by any means harm you. Thank you. Now, let me tell you something about the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Wow! And you have the Spirit of the Word living inside of you. And keep in mind, that Spirit that is inside of you, the Word was in the beginning, He's inside of you, and He was with God, and He was God, and nothing that was made, including you, nothing that was made that was made was made without Him. He made everything. And then he turned around, and one of the things he made, you, he gave authority over all the other things he made. I told Loretta last night, I said, I'm, I'm at a debate on what to talk about, because i got several things running through my head, and I, I shared this with her. And, uh, and I said, one of the other things is, 
I'd like to do a message or something called the qualifiers. Because, and then later she said, just write a book on it. Because every scripture you find that talks about us getting set free, there's a qualifier. If you do this, then this. And everybody wants to read the this, but they don't want to read the if you. If you do this part. You, you know what I mean? Even as simple as John 3.16, God loved the whole world. And He loved the world so much that He sent His Son so that qualifier, whoever believes, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everything that we receive is based upon a qualifier, upon whether we believe it or not. And here's the thing. Most people, even in the church, especially in the church, we get so religious that we, we don't seem to believe that the one who spoke everything into existence, this is not a matrix. We're not living in assimilation. We are living in a place where a word was spoken and we were created. And the one who spoke the word gave us authority over everything else he created. And nothing shall by any means harm us if you believe it. But if you don't believe it, look, if you don't believe it, it'll just become knowledge of something that you've read. It's, it's just kind of like college. Years ago, I had a gentleman come in, and he was, um, I won't say what college it was, but you would all know the college. It's a state-run institution, and institution's a good word. Uh, he was teaching a class that one of my kids was in at this university. And the class was business management and administration. And so I knew this man pretty well. You know, we'd have a cup of coffee together every now and then. And I said to him, I said, you know, what's interesting to me, all of these principles that you teach, you know, my... my child has shared them with me and, and they're so amazing why don't you wh why did you choose teaching why didn't you just go into business and with these business principles you could have been like a bazillionaire you could have had a huge business <laughs> it kind of surprised me when he said well you know I tried opening up a business three different times and all three times I went bankrupt And at that, this true, true story. And at that moment, I thought to myself, and you're teaching my son how to manage a business? Okay. Jesus said in John 6, 63, he said, listen to this. He said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. The Word is living. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And it's alive. And it's been given to us. And if we will just believe what the Word has told us and act on what He has said, then the reality will happen that we'll have authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm us. Nothing. And God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. You know, there's a lady sitting right over there that last week we prayed, and she had a major thing take place in her body with a biopsy and all this. And then we get a call yesterday. They removed it. It was benign. There's no problem. There's no cancer. Well, you look, you've got to believe to receive. Hmm. As Travis Kelsey would say, you got to fight for the right to use the word. All right. Now, here's, here's, remember what Jesus said. <laughs> he said he has, now listen to this. He said he has given you authority. 
Say this. He has given me authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt me. Now, I'll say this. You're equipped. I said you're equipped. Ephesians 4.11 says, my job, my job as a pastor, Ryan's job, our job as pastors, and Loretta, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, what I believe I've done today is I've equipped you with something, and I'm going to tell you what to do now. Do it. I said do it. You've heard it, now do it. Walk in it, live in it. Do it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you the praise. We love you. And we receive your word because your word, he is awesome. In the name of your son, the word. Amen.